We are back, folks, to talk about the legacy of Andrew Jackson once he gets into office. Now, before we can get him into office, though, we need to understand who will be voting for him. If you can recall when we discussed the American Revolution and its immediate aftermath, that many of these new states started placing voting restrictions on their electorate, namely that you had to own property in order to be able to cast your ballot for governor or, you know, for your local representative. By the early 19th century, however, by the 18-teens and 1820s, many of those early voting restrictions have been done away with. And in fact, in many of the newer states coming into the Union, they never have any restrictions uh, aside from, obviously, your race and your gender. You had to be a white male uh, to be able to vote, but they never had any property holding requirements. So when places like uh, Arkansas or Alabama or Indiana come in, they're coming in already, uh, allowing all adult white males to vote. And um, the the so-called common man, if you will, really begins to assert its... Um, that concept begins to kind of insert itself into the political process by the 1820s. It will be, um, you know, this newer generation of voters that don't like fancy titles. They uh, don't like the idea of, ba of bowing and wearing uh, fancy wigs. They associate all these sorts of things with European stuffy uh, politics, and they want their new breed of politicians to be plain-spoken men, to be men of the people you know, kind of rough and tumble, almost like their frontier life. Uh, and so with all that in mind, it's not surprising that Andrew Jackson will be successfully elected president in 1828 and re-elected again in 1832. He really kind of represents uh, sort of uh, the plain-spoken farmer or, uh, you know, rough-and-tumble frontiersman of the age. He will be very popular, for example, among Southern and, and voters along the Western frontier as well. A lot of this had to do with his nickname, Old Hickory, and kind of the way he carried himself. Uh, this was an individual who suffered numerous tragedies in his life. In the Revolutionary War, for example, he was still a teenager, but he tried to help out the Patriot cause by serving as a runner uh, between camps. He was captured and became a prisoner of war in, in a British camp. He and his brother Robert, in fact, they both contracted uh, smallpox. His brother died uh, in British custody during the war. Also, an incident that would live with uh, Jackson for the rest of his life was one day a British commanding officer came in and ordered the you know the young boy Jackson to to clean his muddy boots. Jackson said no, and the soldier or the the uh, the commanding officer pulled out his sword and slashed the young boy across his left cheek and his left hand. He would carry those scars with him for the rest of his life. And he would also carry a deep hatred of anyone that he perceived uh, thought that they were better than him. You know, like that that kind of snobbish British officer. He will also lose another brother at the Battle of Stone O Ferry in the Revolutionary War, and his mother will die of wartime hardships. So um, his father had died many years prior. So he was basically orphaned by the age of 14 and along the Tennessee frontier uh, just kind of you know blew off school preferring to drink and gamble uh, he loved to bet on race horses but somehow managed to get enough of an education to turn into an attorney and eventually became a very successful attorney with a law practice based in Nashville Tennessee and in fact he be actually begins to climb the social ladder in uh, Tennessee politics he became the state attorney general and a very prominent planter who owned more than a thousand acres of land and was was one of the largest slaveholders in the state as well. He then went on to achieve national fame through the uh, fighting, defeating the battle, the Greek Creeks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in the War of 1812. And then, of course, we've also uh, heard about him during the Battle of New Orleans as he defeated the British in the War of 1812. All right, so he's someone that you know got angry very easily. Uh, if you if you you know, made him mad. He challenged you to a duel. He actually carried a couple of bullets in him <laughs> from previous duels and shootouts uh, uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, there's one, for example, that was lodged near his heart um, that caused him pain from time to time. So this was a man that was very outspoken, very brash. He didn't want anyone else telling him what to do, didn't want anyone else looking down on him. This is the new chief executive. 
in 1828. All right, so um, when it comes to the so-called five civilized tribes, um, a number of Native American tribes, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Creek, the Cherokee, and Seminole, many of them had settled down. These are the eastern tribal peoples. They had settled down. The Cherokee Nation was really um, the one that assimilated the best with Americans. Uh, for instance, they developed their own alphabet. You can see I've got a picture of Sequoia here who develop a, helped to develop a Cherokee written language. Language. They'll develop their own constitution, the Cherokee Nation will, uh, with their own body of laws modeled on the U.S. Constitution. They're going to settle down. Some of them will adapt, uh, adopt Christianity. They're going to adapt farming techniques. They're going to really do about as much as they can to blend in right, with their fellow southern neighbors in places like Georgia, the state of Georgia. That will not be enough, however, to protect them from the first gold rush in our nation's history. We often think of the first gold rush in our nation's history as that that happened in 1849 in California, but that was not the case. The first gold rush here in the United States happened in the state of Georgia, specifically around Dahlonega, Georgia, in Lumpkin County up to the north. And as you start to see people flocking to this region prospecting for gold, uh, lured in by the, the idea that they could strike it rich, they are beginning to trans, uh, you know, to basically, uh, you know, go on to Cherokee territory. And the Cherokee will begin saying, this is not cool. You're coming onto our land. We own this land. You know, we're peacefully coexisting with all of our neighbors. Get out. Okay, so by 1828, um, you know, the Cherokee are essentially filing suit against the state of Georgia. You know, the state of Georgia is trying to displace them, trying to take over their ancestral homelands and open up this region, not just just to gold prospecting, but to settlers who want to settle their family here, and the Cherokee are fighting back. Uh, they're doing so legally, too. Remember, they have their own constitution that they had written up based on the U.S. Constitution, so they, they knew their rights underneath the Constitution. And the Supreme Court of the United States will actually side with the Cherokee, um, and they will decide that the Cherokee are correct, that the state of Georgia needed to ease off, leave them alone, respect their territorial rights. However, Andrew Johnson Johnson did not, or excuse me, Andrew Jackson uh, did not agree. Ultimately, President Jackson, along with his administration and Congress, will pass the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which will force not only the Cherokee, but the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Creek, and the Seminole will force these eastern tribal peoples out of their ancestral homelands once and for all and will resettle them on reser land reserved for them in the Oklahoma Territory, much of what will later uh, become known as Oklahoma. This is a tragic uh, set of circumstances. It's often referred to as the Trail of Tears because these people don't want to leave their homeland. They've done nothing wrong. And it's also uh, listed as the Trail of Tears because uh, a, a huge death toll will result from this forced relocation of the Cherokee tribe, for example, about 16,000 individuals, uh, 4,000, which is to say about a quarter of their numbers will be lost during this long and arduous trip westward. Uh, so yeah, uh, in this case, President Jackson will um, basically not listen to the Supreme Court of the United States. He will disregard entirely what the court has said about respecting these people's rights and instead will force through his program of removal. In the case of the nullification crisis in South Carolina, we're going to see that Jackson was also committed to keeping the Union intact. South Carolina, along with a number of other southern states, are very upset over the high taxes that have been placed on imported manufactured goods, mostly because the southern states rely so heavily upon imported manufactured goods. There, there's virtually no manufacturing in the southern states. It's, it's an agricultural society based on cash crops. So South Carolina, with the help of then Vice President John C. Calhoun, uh, decided to come up with the idea that an individual state, if they so chose, could nullify, which is to say basically do away with an act of Congress if they felt like it was unconstitutional. 
Um, President Jackson, while he is a Southerner, does not agree with this idea. South Carolina will ultimately vote to nullify the Tariff of 1828 and begin assembling an armed force to defend itself in case need be. This is a challenge uh, from the standpoint of President Jackson. And if there's anything he does with a challenge, it's not run away from it. He runs towards it. So Jackson will have a very swift and very severe reaction to South Carolina's nullification theory. He essentially will declare the principle of nullification ridiculous. He will nullify the concept of nullification. It's illegal, okay, he said. An individual state cannot just pick and choose what laws it wants to abide by or what laws it thinks is un are unconstitutional. He will also persuade Congress to pass the Force Act, in which he was authorized to raise a military force and send it into South Carolina, if need be, to make sure that this crisis did not get any bigger. South Carolina was surprised um, in some respects. I think they expected a fellow Southerner like President Jackson to support them. Um, and South Carolina was also surprised because they expected other Southern states to rally around them, you know, to kind of give them support. However, when it became clear that President Jackson was about to drop the hammer on South Carolina. The other southern states kind of quietly <laughs> receded to the background. Um, this is a learning lesson uh, from the standpoint of South Carolina. And when, if we fast forward, uh, you know, uh, a little more than 30 years, it's not going to be an accident that South Carolina will also be the first state to secede from the Union as the Civil War approaches. They learned their lesson this first time, and they knew they couldn't go it alone. They're going to have to back down against Andrew Jackson. The next time they make the decision to raise an armed force, they will have the full backing of many other southern states. We'll see the Bank of the United States will become, uh, in Jackson's estimation, a thorn in his side. He, like many, especially poorer Southerners, hated the Bank of the United States. It regulated who you these smaller state, uh, state banks could do credit with. It seemed like to Jackson that it was, uh, uh, you know, just an unjust association between big business and the U.S. government. Because the Bank of the United States during this time period was the only bank that the United States could deposit its, um, its uh, monies into for safekeeping. Also, Andrew Jackson, on a personal level, hated the director of the Bank of the United States, a man by the name of Nicholas Biddle. So um, I'm condensing things because I'm running out of time, but I expect you to read much more about this in your textbook. Essentially what we're going to see though is as Andrew Jackson is preparing to run for re-election to the presidency in 1832, he's going to wage war against the Bank of the United States and Henry Clay who is running against him in this contest, who supports the bank. Ultimately the upshot of all of this is Andrew Jackson will come out on top. He will manage to uh, basically stop the Bank of the United States um, from being rechartered and will effectively lead to the death of the Second Bank of the United States. While this is a huge victory for Andrew Jackson personally, it unfortunately will have ne a negative effect on the nation, especially the credit industry in the United States. Uh, it's going to lead to a series of economic depressions uh, that some of his successors to the presidency will have to deal with. Um, Jackson was one of those figures that was a lightning rod for controversy. You either loved him or you hated him. There were very few people who were in between on Andrew Jackson and his presidency. So one of the major effects of, of his time in office is he's going to polarize the political system here in the United States. Remember that it had been one party rule. It had been the Democratic Republican Party fielding candidates. That ends with Andrew Jackson. You can see this political cartoon from the time period in which um, his opponents, this is a critical cartoon of him, his opponents are basically showing him as a would-be monarch, someone who is just using his powers arbitrarily for his own gain, stepping on the Constitution of the United States. So we're going to see the rebirth of two political parties now. Uh, one that continues to support Jackson and his policies, uh, the Democratic Party, and then the formation of the National Republican Party, which will also be known as the Whig Party during this time period. These are going to be the people that 
uh, just hate Andrew Jackson. They hate many of his policies. They think he's dragging the nation's finances into ruin with him killing the Second Bank of the United States. They just, they just think that he's a disaster. So Jackson is very important from the standpoint of enough people don't like him that we have a new political party being formed just to get rid of him and his followers.